Great. Good morning. Uh, as Josh said, I'm going to give a quick overview of uh, what Secure Boot is at a very, very basic level, and then some discussion of why there is certainly a strong argument that implementing Secure Boot in a meaningful way involves a certain degree of kernel modification. I'm going to briefly give an overview of what those modifications are, different ways we have attempted to implement them, and what the current state of affairs is. So, Secure Boot is designed to um, prevent untrusted code running before an operating system. At this point, the assumption is that uh, if you can compromise an operating system, then it should be difficult for you to persistently compromise an operating system. You may be able to run within the operating system environments, but you should not be able to make that compromise persistent. So you should not be able to modify the bootloader in such a way that it's able to modify the kernel at boot time. You should not be able to modify the kernel itself in such a way that when the bootloader boots it, it's running in a compromised state in such a way that you can no longer trust any other security components because they rely upon the kernel. This means effectively that you have a signed bootloader that your firmware is signed and that the drivers that run within the firmware environment are signed and that various payloads, so the things that the bootloaders load, should probably also be signed in order to construct a complete security chain. That means that you now know that Assuming that your firmware itself hasn't been compromised, everything your firmware loaded was trusted, everything that was loaded by your firmware then loads something trusted, that component is then able to implement your security policy and you know that it can be trusted, you know that your security policy can be trusted. But when thinking about this, it helps to um, think about what a bootloader is. And a bootloader is something that runs in ring zero. It has full access to system memory, all the hardware resources. It's able to read some files off disk. It's able to relocate them into the appropriate place in memory. And then it jumps into them. And then you're running uh, an operating system, you hope. So the problem with this definition of a bootloader, which is pretty much the functional definition of a bootloader, is that there are then other things that you would not traditionally think of as bootloaders, but which are, by that definition, bootloaders, uh, such as kexec, which is clearly a bootloader, and in fact is so clearly a bootloader that there are systems shipping that use kexec as a bootloader. They have a Linux kernel in Flash, they boot that kernel, and then they run a small user space, and that launches the real kernel later. That means they don't have to write two sets of drivers. They can just use the Linux drivers for everything. Uh, but when I say kexec, obviously kexec is an exposed aspect of this functionality. Kexec exists in the kernel. You can already use kexec to load Linux. It would not be too difficult to modify kexec in order to load Windows instead. The protocol required for that is actually publicly documented. There is even an open source implementation of a Windows bootloader from the React OS project. Porting that into kexec would not take someone that long. Why do we care about Windows? Uh, why do we care about Windows? Because Windows is controlled by Microsoft, and Microsoft control the revocation policy for the signing authority that we use. Our ability to boot on modern computers involves us having non-revoked signatures. Greg, how about you actually think instead of slavish adherence to the written word? Sure, sure. Absolutely. But okay, fine, great. I agree that it is not documented that should you be able to load a compromised Windows, this will inherently mean that your signatures are revoked. Uh, and if, you, if you're not worried about that, then don't worry about it. Have a happy life. Ignore everything I'm saying here. Uh, yes. Right. Um, I do not work for Canonical, and therefore I am not required to defend Canonical's security policies. Sure. And 
If you want to do this because you're concerned about Microsoft, I think that's a good reason to do it. If you want to do it because you want to do it for your own benefit, you should do it for that instead. Just pretend I don't say anything about Microsoft. Your life, again, will be much better in that respect. But when I talk about KExec, uh, KExec is obviously a system call, a piece of user space, but KExec is also, we can think of it just as kernel functionality. If you can load our dream modules, you can implement KExec in the kernel, even if the kernel doesn't otherwise implement KExec. If you're able to perform arbitrary DMA, then you can modify the running kernel and you can effectively load arbitrary modules, which means you effectively have KExec. If you're able to insert arbitrary ACPI code into your firmware, then you're able to perform arbitrary memory access, which means you can load arbitrary codes into the kernel, which means you effectively have KExec. So there's various ways that you can get code into the kernel. There's various uh, repercussions of that. You may be worried because you then think that someone is going to implement a Windows bootloader with this functionality, or it may be that you have uh, your own reasons for implementing security. From my perspective now, my day job involves me caring about this because I care about preventing our hypervisors being compromised by someone gaining some degree of privilege in user space on the system. I don't actually have to worry about Microsoft anymore. It's very liberating. At the most straightforward level, restricting these is cap uh, trivial. Uh, there's a limited number of entry points, uh, and we can just define a policy, and then if that policy is met, we can say, no, you're not allowed to do this. It's a simple matter of coding. Tying it to secure boot is fundamentally inelegant, though. Uh, the aim is not to make this functionality specific to a particular technology or implementation. The aim is to try to find a solution that permits us to uh, bring functionality to the wider kernel community. People should be able to use whatever solution we come up with without having to care about secure boots. They should be able to use it in similar trusted boot environments. They should be able to use it if they're using TPM remote attestation and trusted boots rather than secure boot. So um, while initially we kind of started with just this for prototyping, uh, we decided that that was not likely to fly upstream. So, uh, okay, what features do we have in the kernel that allow us to do this? At the most basic level, you could think of using the existing kernel security mechanisms, the LSMs, so stuff like SE Linux or AppArmor. Problem with those is that the policy then comes from user space. You don't necessarily trust even your initial user space in this scenario. You want the low-level policy to be implemented by the kernel without having to trust that user space will set that up correctly. Then moved on to capabilities. Just say no. Big problem with capabilities is that the, uh, the general capabilities model is you drop all capabilities except the ones you need. That's the only secure way to implement capabilities. If you drop capabilities you don't, if you drop known capabilities that you don't need and keep hold of all other capabilities, then if someone adds a new capability and something that was previously restricted to root but is now possible by anyone with that capability, then suddenly your code is able to do things that it wasn't able to do before, and that potentially introduces a security vulnerability. So instead, code has to drop all capabilities except the ones it knows it needs. If you then introduce a new capability check for something that that code previously did, so say if uh, opening a specific device node now requires cap compromised kernel, then that code is no longer able to open that device node, even if you're running on a system that doesn't implement secure boot even if you haven't taken that capability away. The code has dropped it. Capabilities are an awful idea. Everyone involved should be ashamed. Uh, this is POSIX capabilities. The security community technically has a meaning for capabilities that has almost nothing to do with POSIX capabilities. So instead, let's just blame POSIX because that seems fair in general. Uh, Yeah, Fedora 18 and 19 shipped with this tight capabilities, and various bits of user space just broke, and there's no elegant way of fixing them. It was primarily libvirt, and QEMU could no longer do TCI pass-through with devices because they wouldn't start up and they would drop all their capabilities, and we had protected the TCF config space. Yes. Config space and MMIO space. Yeah. 
So we could fix libvert, fine, but then there would be other broken things and the entire we don't break user space mantra that um, we keep claiming the kernel implements. Uh, that would be a problem. Uh, that was not really going to fly. If that had actually landed in the kernel, then it would have ended up being reverted. And also, there were people who maintain capabilities who were not enthusiastic about capabilities being used this way. So that was an awful idea. Thankfully, I didn't spend too many months on it. We can tie into module signatures, um, the assumption there being that if you've implemented module signing, then you clearly don't want it to be possible to get untrusted codes into the kernel, and therefore you should just automatically impose restrictions on anything else that would let you get arbitrary codes into the kernel. You can construct corner cases where it breaks. James came up with one where basically you can say, well, I can control the set of user space that's able to k-exec, and I can ensure that they only have the ability to k-exec trusted code. Therefore, it is unreasonable to tie k-exec signature requirements to signed modules, because I could have a separate policy imposed that does this. And that brings us to the current approach, which is um, something equivalent to the BSD secure level. This is a simple global security policy. It starts at zero, which means you can do anything. You can set it to one, and then you can do much less. In the BSD world, you can set it to two or three as well, which restrict things even further. And the idea is you can only ever increase that number. You can't decrease it. If it's set to one, you can't set it back to zero. If it's set to two, you can't set it to one or zero. Right now, the implementation I have just takes everything that the previous two patches did and ties them to the secure level. If it's set to one, then you can't load unsigned modules. You can't k-exec arbitrary code. You can't uh, do things that would permit you to do arbitrary DMA from user space. Alan Cox posted an implementation to LKML back in 1998, and Linus snacked it. Uh, Linus, in fact, called it a dreadful idea because capabilities were much more elegant and useful. This makes me sad. Anyway, history is clearly on our side here, as 15 years later we've discovered that capabilities are almost entirely useless and generally are a way to introduce security bugs rather than remove them. So, arguably, taking something that has worked well for other operating systems and forcing it to Linux is a reasonable thing to do. I'm clearly, at this point, just horrifically burned out. Can we please merge something? I will literally give money to whoever merges something. <laughs> if you could actually close the door, that would make this slide a little more convincing. And now we'll move to the discussion phase. So one of the main things that was wrong wrong with secure levels when we posted it is that people wanted it to be more flexible, right? Yep. They wanted it to be finer grained. They wanted you to be able to say, I'm secure level two, which means you have, say, PCI space locked down. Yeah, there isn't one. Exactly, right. Exactly. That's that was the punch that was line. the whole point. They were trying to they were basically trying to go back to the capabilities model. And is is Peter in here? Not uh, Peter Aven. No. no. Okay. So he is of the mind that capabilities does not mean POSIX capabilities, but means capabilities oh. in general. And there he is. Hey. We have Peter the Pirate joining us. We're just talking about you. Um and that's okay. If, if you want to ignore that everybody, when they say capabilities, means POSIX capabilities and, and take back to the general form of the word, uh, that's one thing. So, so, so what you're telling us is your solution is to use capabilities to report No. No. <laughs> Our, my solution is to ignore everyone who says they want fine green secure level. Right. Because they're wrong. There's, there's two different ways you can look at it. You can look at it with POSIX capabilities where you're granted everything and then you drop what you don't need, which breaks and we've found over two releases of Fedora. I'm assuming other people who have used those patches have also run into things. Um, or you can start secure, I'm sorry, start insecure and then turn on stuff you want to protect. 
which basically means for new things that you add, uh, you default to insecure. And so that you is, default to secure and incapable of doing something. No. User space is then, if I run a user space application, well, I have in, in secure boot mode, yes, you yep. turn on the bits that you know about, right? Um, but if you add something, some new use case, right? You, like you said earlier, you, you would default to insecure if you add something new. Yeah, this is why it's a bad idea. Right, so it's, it's, up, it's the opposite of the problem, right? Instead of being granted everything and dropping what you don't need and then finding out something's broken, you turn on everything or you default to insecure, so you're defaulting to insecure, right? So it, it's, it's, we'll call the, the latter one, let's call it permissions instead of capabilities. No, um, not at all confusing. It, yeah, exactly. I mean, the whole thing is, is basically the same thing, it's just inverted. So having fine-grained secure level um, might sound nice, but it, it's really no different than having capabilities from a usability and what breaks standpoint. So right now we have what? Secure level? With Well, the, the point <laughs> that people can tend to make is that it will be used for things other than secure boot, right? That's why it's called secure level. Yeah. So, for instance, right now the implementation is tied to, um, there is a config option that allows you to tie it to secure boot such that when the kernel boots, if secure boot's enabled, the kernel automatically sets the secure level. But alternatively, we could have it set up so that there's a kernel parameter this allows you to do that, and then if you're using a TPM-based boot, you can measure the kernel command line, you can measure the kernel, and then you know that it was put into secure level mode when you boot it. And again, you don't have to trust user space. Sure. So right now, I mean, maybe, maybe it would be... But in that case, you're still using one big switch, so that you're not... It is still one big switch, yeah. Right, and so that big switch covers PCI space, it covers um, some debug FS and SysFS stuff, it covers ACPI, uh, RSDP. Yeah. There is a very simple policy. If user space can use a feature to insert arbitrary codes in the kernel, this should disable that feature. But if you do that, if you disable the exec, you can't use the updates in the kernel. Right, but if you want to prevent getting untrusted codes in the kernel, you have to disable k exec. If you don't want if you have the ability to define user space policy in such a way that you can use k-exec, then you can impose policy using se or something instead. Sure. You would not enable this option. That's the attractive component. You have a situation in which you can define a user space policy. And if you can define a user space policy, you can use an existing LSM to impose an appropriate policy. You can use capabilities, you can use SE Linux, you can use App Armor. You don't need the in kernel policy definition. Yeah, you could do that. You, when you build your kernel, you do not say yes to the option that says enable secure level on secure boot. Distributions should make sure that they provide functionality appropriate to their supported use cases. So what was the question? The question was that uh, the concern is that there may be use cases that are tied to secure boot, but where you want a different policy. Could I change maybe to R? There, OK, there are cases where James wants secure boot and does not want to disable k-exec. I think it's I think it's more than just James though. I mean I think Greg, you had something for K exec. Right. Okay, and as I keep saying, I understand that these use cases exist. It's just that these use cases implementing a subset of this policy makes no sense. You need to there's no point in having module signing if root can inject arbitrary code into your kernel anyway. Okay, there's no point in using enforced module signing if you don't also have a mechanism for 
how about we just put this in boot params? Oh, so, so you use MOK to set the requested one, and then, right, and then the, sure, we could modify, if we put it in boot params, then we could have grub read a trusted variable and use that to pass the value to. We can certainly put that at a lower level. If you want the ability to ensure that there's a user override even using a distro kernel that's done in a secure way, we can add that functionality, well, I, yeah. I want the ability to ensure there's a secure override. So rather than yes. the MOK press the user test is secure. Yes. So if the MOK press the user test into a secure override at a secure level, what is it? What is it? That, right. that satisfies all of our use cases. And if it's permanently stored in a boot service system. Well, we, we already have an MOK variable that lets you switch to insecure mode using the physical present test, and then, right, it, I, I understand. Since we already have that, we can also add this. Okay, if we add that to shim and MOK tool, and then we ensure that that gets passed through to the kernel in a meaningful way, will you then agree to this? Right, MOK tool's part of the shim code base, so. The ship project. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Greg, does that make you happy? Okay, so the idea is that instead of just having the policy hard codes in the kernel, rather than having the kernel key off secure boot, there would be another EFI variable that would be set by MOK, uh, by MOK manager. So in the same way that you can right now do MOK util minus minus insecure, and then on the next boot, mock util, uh, mock tool will prompt you to enter the password and then disable validation. We can have a, you can do MOK tool minus minus disable paranoia, and then you don't have to worry about a distro kernel imposing a policy that you don't want imposed. No, but like. Okay, so the idea then would be, it's not tied to UEFI. It's just that in a UEFI environment, the default policy would be this. You would have the ability to override that policy, and then we could either have that as a UEFI ver uh, variable that you read, or we can have the bootloader pass it via boot params. That works for you. Okay. Does anyone have under just, anyway, does anyone have any other objections? Is there any reason we should not allow this code to get married to the kernel? Does, does everybody understand what we're actually locking down with this switch? No, no, it's actually different. And the problem with capabilities was that even if you weren't booting via secure boot, libvirt broke because it dropped the capability. Yeah, it was horrible. And so in this case, it would only be broken if you were booting via secure boot, which means, which is a much more reasonable thing because then you can just tell the user, well, disable this if you want to continue being able to DMA all over your kernel. Oh, uh, well, yeah, unfortunately, Linus isn't here. Uh, right, I'm, he's not here. It is obviously conceivable that Linus will not like this. Uh, and in that scenario, I'm just going to fall back to the please suggest something better. I will take anything that works. I have no religious attachment to any specific implementation here. I will write anything, <laughs> anything if it will get merged. I can implement this. If somebody wants this to be implemented in ACPI bytecode, I will do it that way. <laughs> I am entirely serious here. <laughs>
Sure. Right, and I'm sure if we really, okay, so one thing that we could do in terms of secure level is uh, sparsely populated. If we have a, rather than have secure level one, if we have secure level 100, then we have plenty of space for people to put in different uh, subsets of that if they think that there's a use case where that makes sense. James, stop talking. <laughs> I am unfortunately constrained by the, uh, all those ticky boxes we signed for registration. I'm not allowed to threaten you with physical violence. So let's just leave it at that. Okay, so plan is to put it, push it down a layer and then post the patches. Right, so if we... Hi, we're not using capabilities. Great. <laughs> so who's, who's tree? Whose tree is this going through? Well, so far, nobody has volunteered to carry it in a tree. And if I have to create a tree and do it, I will. But I would arguably say it should go through the security tree. And I think it should go through SCSI. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. If you want to try that, uh, I can guarantee your patch will never get in after what we just said after the last merge window. Right. Uh, yeah. James Morris is here somewhere, right? And he's probably at the security summit. Yeah, he's downstairs. Conveniently scheduled. Is uh, England. In, is he in the plug fest? <laughs> uh, he just got married. <laughs> How have you managed to stay married? Right, okay, brilliant. Okay, should we move on? Does anyone have any other, yeah? Well, I know, I know that James actually went through and reviewed the secure modules patches and- Then I filed off the security, uh, filed off the serial numbers and replaced it with secure level instead. Yeah, so it might be good to talk to him at some point. Yeah. yeah. The security people do want to come and talk to us at some point with that, so we should just leave the thing there. Right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. One can always hope. All right. Um, what time is break supposed to be at? <laughs>